Milo, whatever you want to share, we are all a sponge because we want to learn from you. So thank you. It's your party. And thank you for all the people that are on the call. Well, uh, listen, thank, thank, thank you, Karen, for that introduction, for, of course, for your community all these years. I, I didn't realize how long uh, you've been doing the work, and it, it is impressive. Uh, I wasn't sure if you distributed some of the organizing. Sometimes some of these very efficient, effective organizations grow uh, virtually as well so it's it but it's neat to hear you've got such a dynamic group doing the work for these year many years and 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 specifically thanks ellen for for thinking the work that we're doing is worth bringing to your community here and happy to spend the next hour with you uh telling you about what we're doing uh and, and i'll tell you a little bit about myself i'm a all volunteer organization leader the organization is called the media and democracy project we've got a website outlining some of our work i'm going to walk you through that work today I'm gonna speak in the New York Minute. I am actually based in New York City. Uh, this is a passion of mine, the work that I'm about to present with you, but I'll definitely uh, present some slides to you that may seem uh, overwhelming, or if you've got other uh, things that you're kind of doing at the same time, and for the community members who haven't been able to attend, uh, I'll share with Ellen uh, and Karen the copy of these slides. So you will get these slides uh, to review at your own. Some of them have hot links, some of them have references. So. Uh, that's kind of my style is to kind of give a lot of information, but definitely want you to have a reference so you don't have to pencil down and wonder what I actually, what the link was or the URL or any of that business, you'll get it all. Um, and then I definitely want to hear from you because I think we're all kind of with the same aspirations of why we spend this time in community trying to make the aspirational democracy of America better, more inclusive, uh, and more representative uh, for, and implement a uh, policy that impacts the common good. I'm particularly drawn to this kind of work because I think the future of planet Earth depends on Americans coming together uh, with the rest of the world and solving the climate crisis. Um, and some of the barriers to that are a, uh, a, a, a ineffective and somewhat sabotage hampered political system, especially in the states that actually meet that crisis. There are many other reasons, injustice, inequality, that I think are obviously very important. But for me, there's this existential threat that all humans need to come together and recognize. And right now, uh, people are not aware, A, of the problem and are too uh, separated and uh, kind of marginalized uh, in terms of power structures to actually do anything about it. So I will now share my slides with you. Thanks for letting me run a deck. I'm happy to go through this. Uh, I am also happy to look at the, keep one eye on the chat as well. So feel free if I see it, I'll do my best to answer in real time. This isn't a lecture that you need to wait till the end, the end. Uh, I just have so much stuff I'm excited to talk to you about that I'm just going to go and fly through it. So let's start with the title. Super excited to be here and chat with more folks about the impact of media. Um, and once again, we are, and I'm the executive director with the Media and Democracy Project. And one of our kind of operational kind of founding principles is an informed citizenry is the bedrock of a democratic society. The information we receive from news and media affects our opinions, our voting decisions, our degree of civic engagement, and ultimately shapes the health of our society and collective futures. Um, you can read our mission statement uh, a little longer uh, when you go through the slides later, but we are a C4, we're nonpartisan, and we're also a nonprofit. We're self-funded, uh, and we've been doing this for about four years. Um, so the problem that we see and what motivates... You know, before you get going, yes. I just want to make sure, Marge, did we push the record button? Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Love it. Would, would hate to wait till the end to recognize <laughs> that hadn't happened. Okay, so 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 kind of what the what the goals for our work is that the the problem really is is most Americans are fed a media diet or an information diet that underinforms, misinforms, and disinforms them. Right. We all have neighbors and social networks. We're trying to reach people. We're trying to meet allies. We're trying to meet people in the supermarket. But there's a combination of factors that led us to this scenario. And we're very interested in understanding that history. And basically, none of this is really uh, accidental. This is actually the consequence of some policy and social decisions almost 100 years in the making. The deregulation, consolidation of corporations, of media companies in particular, the changes in technology, the transformation when newspapers used to be the sole source of information was 30 years ago, and maybe some evening news, and, the, and that was about it. But the change in the ad revenue business of journalism has changed dramatically in the last 30 years. It used to be a cash cow to own a paper in St. Louis. And I, uh, was it Hearst? Or I think one of the barons actually comes out of St. Louis. I mean, it, it used to be a gold mine to own a paper 
it basically Pulitzer. printed money. You'd, you'd, you'd have ad revenues of somebody at a wedding engagement, a funeral, sell their car, sell their house. There was no Craigslist. There was no Facebook. There was no eBay. It all went into Hearst's pocket. The journalism was kind of a byproduct to some extent, or at the very least, journalism and the newspaper industry was really, in some cases, just an add-on and definitely was uh, was allowed to subsist on ad revenue. And as technology changed and the inter- advent of the internet for all commerce, that revenue disappeared. And in this country, there's been no effort meaningfully at a policy level to try and rectify that as the founders knew that journalism is essential for the democracy, uh, uh, the fledgling democracy in, in, in the colonies, uh, the decades and centuries later, people still haven't figured out how we do, how do we support journalism for the point of supporting democracy? And we'll talk about some of the things. Uh, I think, Milo, one more thing. Had yes. you um, started sharing slides because I just saw a chat that no one oh, is I seen. thought I had, and I think I stopped. Uh, so let me reach. Uh, thank you okay, again. Thank you. Yep. Yep. So once there again, we go. there we go. Thank you. No team, team effort. Thank you all. Thanks for it. <laughs> no, be bashful. Definitely raise your hands. Okay. So this is our guiding principle. Whatever your issue, this is from a, 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 a very insightful uh, uh, Bob McChesney, who's a professor of communications, who's really at the forefront of thinking about the connection between media and democracy. Um, uh, is whatever your air, first issue of concern, climate, reproductive rights, Media had better be your second because without change in the media, progress in your primary area is far less likely. Getting to the point of people who you're trying to receive and influence are getting messages completely different than yours. uh, And media is a profound uh, source of how people are forming their opinions and understanding of the world. So I'm very curious, what do people on this Zoom consume? I like to think of what, where do you, your information sources or your information diet? So maybe we can just spend 30 seconds if you're on the Zoom and post in the chat, kind of what do you read? What do you listen to? What are your news sources, newspapers, evening news? And then I'm going to put something, there's like a second category, these kind of sources, which are curated things like do you subscribe to f- uh, Facebook feeds or Twitter or podcasts or, you know, are you consuming kind of corporate media or more curated that you kind of bespoke made as your information menu? Um, and then the follow-up question is, is there, are there particular news organizations that you subscribe to, that you pay for? There's another level. And obviously that's a complex issue. Not all Americans can afford to pay for the news. One of our side mantras is democracy dies in paywalls, right? If you're going to run the New York Times and the Washington Post and insist that people pay $300 a year, you're actually excluding a big segment of America from actually accessing your news. Maybe that's intentional, maybe it's unintentional, but it does have an impact. Um, people will always want and seek low cost or free news sources, just a matter of fact. Um, and then cumulatively, just curious, like how much time do people spend? It can be passive. It could be listening to the radio. You have two hour drive to and fro and you have news on or you listen to a podcast. Um, and I'm curious and I'll hear kind of what people are up to. And, uh, you know, there's there, there are things like the staples, the 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 potatoes and uh, wheat bread that everybody consumes mostly at some of the major legacy media, maybe like the New York Times we're expecting, maybe NPR, that sort of thing. But uh, it's helpful to start from a starting point of what do the people on this call feed their minds and where do we get our news? Um, and uh, and Linda, if you don't mind, just mind putting, if you have a particular paper that you subscribe to, subscribe to, uh, is it? Is it the dispatch that you all have there? So in any event, so so I'll, I'm curious. And when we when we maybe have a little round table towards the end of the session, I'd love to hear people's thoughts on that after hearing my presentation. Um, but I will highlight that the majority of Americans consume a very different diet than than kind of what's appearing uh, in the in in the, in the chat and what I myself consume. Uh, the 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 as I said, with the changes in ad revenue to journalism and news and changing practices and technology. There are only a handful of companies that are really producing the vast amount of uh, political and electoral information, and they're all in very large corporations. So when we think of ABC News that held the debate, it's really a subsidiary of the Walt Disney Entertainment uh, Corporation. Paramount is really CBS. NBC is a subsidiary of Universal, CNN. You see where this is going. Uh, I I do have some circles around a a media owner uh, who does exert influence overtly in his media properties, and that's Rupert Murdoch and News Corp that is the parent of Fox News. Uh, Notably, two of his uh, acolytes are leading two of our other major institutions, just in case people aren't aware. 
Uh, these are people who clearly share the same values and editorial objectives as Rupert Murdoch to some extent, not as, as, as overtly and as extreme as Fox, uh, but that to survive and succeed in the Murdoch empire, you must think like the uh, the boss. And so just so you know, if you're not aware, it's been the last about six months or so, maybe nine months actually, uh, that uh, the Washington Post has been led by uh, Sir Will Lewis, uh, of the Murdoch uh, uh, ig ignominious uh, phone hacking scandal fame. Uh, it is still unclear as to what his role was in the cleanup of that. And he does have some uh, tarnish on his reputation. And the Wall Street Journal is led by Emma Tucker, who's yet another, and that is a Wall Street Journal is a Murdoch property itself. I just think it's important. And then people in America don't often think about it, but the Sulzberger family is a sixth generation uh, in controlling ownership and publishers of the New York Times. So though. Uh, most folks do read the New York Times. It does have uh, a history and it is run by a very small family. Uh, and although it is publicly traded, it is a very unique uh, media property, but it does, it does have some significant pitfalls. And we might get a chance to touch on that. So one of the things that we think about is what is American sense of reality? Uh, this was a question asked almost a year ago, which I think just illustrates how confused and ill-informed, uninformed Americans, unfortunately, are about facts around their world on which they're supposedly going to base informed electoral decisions in a few weeks. But this was a question that asked the following, is asking of re self-identified Republicans, independents, and Democrats, what is, is the inflammation, sorry, let me reframe it. Is the unemployment rate at a 50 year high? I think most people on this call know it is actually at a 50 year low and it's been so for 16 consecutive months. Well, Republicans answered that yes, it is at a it, it is a 50 year high. This is, a, this is an unreality. This is this is there's no debate about this. It's not a partisan issue. 60 percent of Republicans said, yeah, the information they've received. Nobody knows the unemployment rate. It's they've learned about this from their information diet. Well, 60 percent of Republicans self-identified said that uh, unemployment rates at a 60 at a 50 year high. This is terrifying. But you could say maybe this is partisan. This is a surrogate. A reflection on the administration and, and dislike of Biden and the Democrats. So, OK, that's still a ridiculously high number of Americans who don't have a grasp of a really important economic indicator. The scary thing is the 40 percent of Democrats who identified that falsely that unemployment is at a 50 year high. That's terrifying. That means they do not have a grasp of reality. And that makes our work in terms of doing the work even harder if we don't have a shared reality. So that's something that I use to illustrate some of the concerns we have. And multiple factors, I kind of use this term, something about disinformation. Uh, we've, you've probably heard the term, it's intentionally manipulated news or content that's to manipulate people in some particular way. Some extreme examples are the election was stolen in 2020, led people to storm the Capitol as part of an insurrection and coup attempt in 2021. Well, some of that stuff doesn't just come in the Fox ecosystem and then stay there. It actually comes through and works through uh, the information sources everyone just mentioned here. Um, there's been discussion a lot in the last three weeks about the concept of tariffs and how the nominee for the Republican Party describes his, what he thinks tariffs are and do. Uh, and it's kind of been a bit confusing for folks. Well, are raising tariffs going to raise any money? And the answer is absolutely not. Um, but I use this as an example that although people on this call very do not consume Fox or right wing propaganda, it actually trickles through and actually works its way beyond its primary uh, audience. Um, I'm going to skip a couple of slides. Uh, so some of the things that we think a lot about is euphemisms. This is one of the things that we are concerned about. And some of the work we do is actually engage journalists one on one or sometimes as a community to ask them to do better. So I think I think Karen had a question about uh, kind of doing fact checking and outreach or kind of what we do. Well, one of the things that we do is we are very attuned to the language that is chosen by journalists because journalists are the ones who are informing our fellow Americans. Right. So we can reach one or two people. We can table. We can send postcards. But someone doing the evening news reads is potentially millions of people or hundreds of thousands. And if they choose a frame or language that is filled with euphemism that buries reality, that's dangerous. So first being attuned to this problem of language and language choices is step one. And step two, well, what do you do with it? Well, here are some of the kind of the problematic ones. Um, Pro-life, I think folks on the call know that that's kind of a frame that we've been working on to bring some reality to. And the alternate to that is not anti-life. 
uh, it's reproductive rights and bodily autonomy and and abortion rights. So um, and so thinking about language and uh, responding to some of those choices. One of the personal one, the one that speaks to me the most is there was no such thing as attempts to overturn the election in 2020 and 2021. There was an attempt to subvert American democracy and overthrow the elected government of Joe Biden. That's what actually happened. If you look in the history books, there's no, well, in 1875, so-and-so tried to overturn the election. We wouldn't use that language. We'd say attempted a coup or attempted to subvert democracy. And this has become my, this sticks in my craw every time I see it, but I use that to illustrate language really matters. You overturn pancakes, you overthrow democracy. Um, Using an example of how powerful news organizations have become, uh, this is a small story, which I think should have been a bigger story. This is from a journalist uh, describing what corporate news organizations dictated to the newsrooms on January 6, 2021. CBS said the following, we don't need to go out of our way to give this an overly dramatic label. The story doesn't need that. We should not be calling this an attempted coup or a terrorist attack. Also, when referring to the people storming the Capitol, protesters, violent protesters, a violent mob, and pro-Trump protesters. NBC gave instructions to its newsroom. The crowd could be called a mob or rioters, but warned staff from using coup or attempted coup. Imagine if for the last four years, the lexicon to describe the events of January 6, 2021 had been an attempted coup. Because right now it has been normalized that the man running for president was the instigator of this event. It wasn't a riot like after a sports match. It was a coup attempt. Technically, for historians language, there's a term for an attempted coup when you're in power to stay in power. It's called an auto gulp. But American journalists are unfortunately not familiar with that term, so we're just hoping that they'd at least go for the more familiar and accessible coup attempt or self-coup. But point being, other ways that news organizations control and frame narrative. After President Biden's catastrophic debate in June, the New York Times didn't write it as a story, it wrote it as the major story of our time. This is a journalist, Jennifer Schultz, who actually quantified this. This is her in a piece of paper and a pencil, really tried to quantify the march to withdraw, to force Joe Biden to uh, step aside. 192 pieces in a week. Now, they have the full right to do that. That's their prerogative. But I use that to illustrate that that's an organization mobilizing its resources with an agenda to make a point. And they have never done this regarding Donald Trump's profound unfitness. After his last debate, which by all measurable terms, Republican, Democrat, independent, neutral party, was an absolute catastrophe for Donald Trump, there was no mobilization of the New York Times to write 192 stories on the unfitness of Donald Trump and asking him to step aside at the New York Times. Um, so, well, what else do we do? Well, there's a whole community of folks journalists, editors who are either actively with bylines and editing or people who are in journalism school and outside, media critics or media reform advocates. One of them is Nicole Hannah-Jones. She's actually uh, at Howard and leaves the Center for Journalism and Democracy, which is a great new institution. They're gonna have something I'll put on your radar screen. Uh, it's called the Summit for Democracy on October 8th, um, where they're gonna talk about journalism and democracy, especially from communities of color perspective, but it's a very well and comprehensive uh, institution that, that should be on your radar screen thinking about media and democracy. Um, and this is a tweet of hers uh, talking about Will Bunch um, that after the debate, uh, sorry, after the uh, Republican convention in Milwaukee, which was really uh, a grotesque scene for people interested in history and politics and actual policy, uh, Will Bunch, who writes for the Philadelphia Inquirer, who's been a very strident advocate for democracy and truth-based and reality-based journalism, had a tweet here that the mainstream media can't handle the truth of Milwaukee, a convention with no politics, just a quasi-religious cult of devotion to Donald Trump. And Nicole Hannah-Jones responded with that, is Will Bunch out here doing the pro-democracy journalism? We will all have to look back at this time and see whether we resisted the erosion of democracy or aided and abetted it. 
So just to bring to your attention, there's a movement within journalism of self-reflection of different parties, people who recognize the importance of the moment and the role that democracy, the role that journalism plays in democracy, and folks who are just worried about getting the next story and trying to find the next funny thing to write about and kind of trying to make sense of some very dangerous uh, 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 clouds on the horizon. Um, so these are two people actively involved in the field, coining terms that I'll bring to your attention of pro-democracy journalism. Right? What is the point of having a democracy enshrined in the Constitution and as a and has a First Amendment protection? It wasn't the Eighth Amendment; it was the first one because the founders recognized that you needed an informed and protected. You need an informed electorate to do that. You needed a free press without government or king or uh, royalty uh, leaning in and stacking the deck. Um, and right now, American journalism and press in large circumstances, the corporate press has not met the moment. They're reporting the 2024 election, like 2020, like 2016 and 2000, without recognizing the inherent threats in a fascistic candidate running for president with his track record legacy and his specific stated goals. So pro-democracy journalism would be the term. So something that we do uh, on our website, we have one for reproductive rights, but we actually empower folks to do letters to the editor and reach out to journalists and write opinion pieces of their own and give them the scaffold. This is a, a specific instrument that we have six demands to make of media when they fail at climate emergency coverage. One, framing and language, call it an emergency. Two, the science is settled, et cetera. But just sharing with you how we think about this problem is you might read a piece about some storm or this is the second hundred year hurricane we've had or the floods are, the, well, what do you do about that? Well, one of them is actually to construct and reach out and have your voice heard. It's more, it's more uh, news, local news outlets are a lot more inclined to publish your op-eds than uh, aiming high and trying to get it as a national outlet. But writing to one of your local news outlets, if you see coverage or reframe a, sto a local story in the setting of some guidelines. So we've made this uh, on our website. We have one for repro rights covering what we think is helping people reach out and act, uh, advocate for better uh, repro rights and climate coverage. Uh, something we talk a lot about in our community is Fox and some of the harms that Fox has brought on the American mind. Uh, it does go way back uh, and that is accelerating. And I'm sure we all have friends and family members and our social networks who've been uh, impacted directly by Fox. But what happens on Fox doesn't stay uh, in Fox. I think one of the more striking ones to me is they spent the better part of the early pandemic when vaccines were coming out undermining public health and safety by questioning the efficacy and safety of vaccines. Uh, and that affected the health and likely killed thousands, multiple thousands of Americans. So it's not just democracy that some of the lies being told on this network uh, have an impact on, but also public health uh, measures and our communities. Um, so one of the things that we've thought a lot about is who's doing some good work. And I just like to elevate on your radar screens. I personally have really become engaged with political cartoonists in the last two years. Uh, some of the most poignant and powerful methods of communicating are visual. Uh, and uh, this era right now of some of the journalists or political commentators doing the best work are actually uh, journal the journalists. This is, this is Mike Lukovich uh, at the Atlantic Journal-Constitution. Uh, and just so folks can't see it on their laptop or their phone, uh, this is an American flag with Donald Trump with a giant pair of shears uh, and Kamala Harris with a needle and thread. Uh, and also the title of this piece is Black Job. Uh, for those who don't get the reference, uh, there have been multiple uh, racist comments by the, the Donald Trump terming uh, jobs being black jobs, which is really an affront to all Americans. And this is a, a powerful statement, both on that racist terminology of the former president uh, and also his impact on America and the role that Kamala Harris is in uh, in rent in restoring American integrity uh, and 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 values. Um, this is a really important point. Uh, this is uh, one of the leader thought leaders in media criticism is Jay Rosen uh, at NYU uh, Media for, uh, uh, Journalism School. Uh, asymmetry between the major parties fries the circuits of the mainstream press. You see, the challenge is if you're a journalist in 2024, you've got an editor, you've got a publisher, and you've got a deadline, and there's a story, something happens. Well, 
Kamala Harris or Democrats say this or do that. And you've got to, according to the traditional model, give equal share and balance to the Republicans. The challenge is, is there's an asymmetry here, an asymmetry in their perspective of reality, an asymmetry in actual policy, an asymmetry in actual agendas. Uh, and so the model that still gets cookie cuttered on a story is not working. And so Jay Rosen refers to this as this asymmetry, because this is how you, this is the origins of the concept of both sidesism. You may have heard that term that people will both sides. One side says this, one side says that, let's call them equivalent. And this asymmetry gets normalized. So our problem with this is it's okay to, and appropriate to describe both sources or both, uh, both sides of an issue, uh, but you do need to provide some context and actually wait to make it clear that these aren't falsely equivalent. Um, so there's an inherent asymmetry right now. For example, going back to tariffs, Donald Trump's proposal to solve the childcare crisis was an anathema to any economist, was an affront to anyone who actually was interested in the issue. Um, but it was actually a front page story on the New York Times where Donald Trump proposed tariffs and Elon Musk was going to be part of an efficiency commission. And they basically made it sound like there was some credibility to his proposal. Um, for those who haven't seen it, Lawrence O'Donnell did a fantastic uh, riff, uh, a piece uh, uh, summarizing, the, 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 frankly, the rot at the New York Times editorial level when it comes to, quote, sane washing Donald Trump, making what is insane policies or insane statements seem somewhat normal in interpreting what he's saying and writing it as if he actually said it in any cogent form. Uh, this is Dana Milbank, who has got a byline. He writes for the Washington Post. My colleagues in the media are serving as accessories to the murder of democracy. Too many journalists are caught in a mindless neutrality between democracy and its saboteurs. Between fact and fiction, it's time to take a stand. That's a pretty powerful statement. This is not some you know, guy in the local bookstore just talking, muttering to himself about what he thinks is going on. This is somebody who works at the Washington Post and has a byline sounding the alarm that there's a problem here in media. Uh, excellent company, the renowned former public editor at the New York Times, columnist formerly at the Washington Post, now with her own wonderful Substack, uh, and also uh, her Substack titled American Crisis. Margaret Sullivan, the public doesn't understand the risks of a Trump victory. That's the media's fault. Tight headline. We'd appreciate that. Nice and accurate. And these are really impactful individuals who are sounding the alarm that the reason Americans don't understand what's happening is there is a very specific focus. It's journalists and editors have yet to meet the moment. And it's our job to help more people understand that it's a problem and also empower them with some tools that they can use. Uh, Will Bunch with another excellent title, Journalism Fails Miserably Explaining What's Really Happening. Um, so what are we doing? What can we do to help? You are not powerless. So let's first start with some uh, some 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 good news. One of the things that we I mentioned in passing is local journalism. I'm curious when I have some time, I'll download the chat and look at it after our event. Um, but there is a, an over-reliance right now on corporate media and there are really wonderful local news outlets. So I just want folks to know that finding, supporting, and becoming and engaging with your local news outlets is a pro-democracy action. It's not charity. It's not selflessness. It's actually good for your community and good for your mind, and you get better journalism. So what did we do? We built this. This is when you go to our website. Uh, this has actually got 1,800 outlets. Feel free to kick the tires. If you see something that should be there in St. Louis environs that you think ought to be there, send me an email. Um, but literally helping both short-term and long-term local news outlets. And you can click on state and you'll actually be able to find some local outlets. A bonus besides subscribing is gifting good information, right? You bring holiday Thanksgiving, you're gonna bring a box of goodies to whoever you visit on Friday. Imagine over the holidays, you gifted subscriptions to good local news outlets, what good that would do. Maybe that Fox relative would get a little bit better information than from Rupert Murdoch's propaganda empire. Right. So that's and it's also a nice place to put your op eds or your comments. So you build some community there and our communities published a bunch of op eds and lo and behold, it turns out they're in their local outlets. Um, and so don't aim high and think your op ed is either the New York Times or nothing. Uh, it's going to have more impact locally. Um, 
Next up, this is the big one that we've just finished and are still rolling out uh, officially, which is pro-democracy election coverage of the guidelines. You heard about Margaret Sullivan, Dan Frumkin, Jay Rosen, all these really smart people criticizing media about what they shouldn't be doing. Well, we've generated, we've pulled all of the what we think are the, the, the main guidelines that a newsroom could implement to be pro-democracy. So what this is, is we're demanding. And we actually signed and we drafted an open letter that you can sign, but we'd also like you to, uh, let's see, I'll put it on the website, put it in the link. Um, but so it's tiny.cc that pro democracy 2024. So you can go and you'll, you'll see on the website and you can sign. And actually we've got close to 5,000 people to sign this open letter. We delivered the first batch of 3,500 signatures to 12 leading American news organization leadership. Now, have they all responded? No. Have any of them responded just yet? No. Um, but there's an intention behind this, is to help move the ball forward of what exactly is pro-democracy journalism, media, and how do you advocate for it? So I'm going to give you some ideas. This is the open letter addressed to media executives, publishers, and journalists. We need you to stand up for America. Our democracy is under attack. Despite being the only president in our history to attempt a coup, those sound jarring words to folks. It shouldn't have been. It's been four years for us to figure out what actually happened that day. Next up. These are the guidelines, just to give you a sample. Treat elections like they matter more than sports scores. Sounds obvious, but if you watch the evening news, a lot of coverage makes it very glib. So-and-so is in this town, they did this, they did that, and it just sounds they may as well just be reporting sports scores. How about prioritizing coverage of the issues that matter to people's lives? Make headlines accurate and informative, not just clickbait. Stop making predictions and pushing polls at the expense of issues. Right. If you've got five minutes at the top of a newscast and you're going to talk about the latest poll or you're the New York Times and you're going to put a poll on the front page of the New York Times, that is real estate that would have been more informative to your news consumers if you'd talked about a policy in that space. OK, so uplift and celebrate election workers, voters in the election process. Right. Right now, there is an overt assault on the Democratic process, voting voter, uh, the, 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 the different polling places, all of the count. I mean, every aspect is literally under assault. Wouldn't it be good for democracy if American news organizations talked about the profile, the good people trying to make this whole system work and how important it is and put voter guides on the front page and what are the voting hours going to be and where's that Dropbox going to be and why Dropboxes are safe? Well, anyway, so point being is we've got a bunch of guidelines. There are 18 of them. I'll give you the three categories. Number one, treat elections like they matter more than sports, make threats to democracy clear, and protect Americans from disinformation. Um, so that's action two. So action one was subscribe to local journalism, if you aren't already. Some of them are free. It's amazing to find how much good news you can get for free. And then number two, sign on to our election coverage guidelines. We'll be updating that. And you'll have good company. We've got a bunch of, frankly, pretty darn thoughtful folks who've signed on to that uh, letter. Um, and we've even, just to, to humble brag for a second, the Margaret Sullivan wrote an entire blog substack piece uh, where she really advocated for the adoption of our guidelines. That was like one of the highlights of our work is we're not just operating in our own little activist sphere, that we're impacting the next layer of the people who are really the problem solvers. That's the former editor of the New York Times wrote a Substack piece about our work saying, here's an idea for media reform that needs to happen. It's a compliment, but it shows you that there's work to be done and we're doing it. Next up, that's this. And you can read the open letter. Next up, so what are we doing? In 2022, the Media Democracy Project identified Rupert Murdoch as our disinformer of the year. For those who don't know, not only does he own and is responsible for Fox News, he actually owns the Wall Street Journal, Barron's, the New York Post, and the publishing house, HarperCollins. And that's only on this continent. Another story for another day, he has significant media properties in the UK and Australia where he began. Another story, we're going to have an event coming up that you'll want to hear about. So sign the open letter. This is another one. This is, should be number three. Sign our open letter to ask the FCC to hold a hearing on Rupert Murdoch's local television station licenses. Fox News broadcast election lies that contributed to the assault on our nation's capital. 
to stop the steal, all of that energy, all of that between November and what happened on January 6th, that insurrection part of the coup attempt, attempt to overthrow American democracy. There were internal emails from the owner of Fox News, or it's really its uh, CEO, uh, President Rupert Murdoch and senior executives that they actually endorsed the lies that were being broadcast over Fox News. So it isn't just that he's owner and he's responsible for what happens. There are internal emails from the Dominion lawsuit of Rupert Murdoch and their senior executives that show they knowingly supported their employees lying to the American people about the 2020 election. It is because of those documents, we believe that Rupert Murdoch and Fox should not be granted other properties they own need FCC licensing. I don't know if you've got a Fox affiliate in, in St. Louis, that's uh, one of the ones that's owned by Fox. The television business is a complicated world. Some stations are owned locally. Some of them are part of, you've probably heard of Sinclair where there's like large uh, uh, collection of stations owned by a larger company, but Fox owns and operates 29 local TV stations. They're owned, they own it outright. To broadcast on, a Fox, uh, on our airwaves in America, over the air, this isn't Fox News, but to use those 29 licenses, they need to ask the FCC for licensing renewal. We've asked, and this is our petition, you can go to foxpetition.com, that the FCC actually hold a hearing to deny the Murdochs and Fox because their other properties broadcast lies over the airwaves with the full support of the same owners that are asking for the license. We believe that is failure of what is called the character qualification. There are criteria to get a broadcast license in America. And we believe that being on the record as having endorsed lying to the American people about something as important as elections should be disqualifying. So we're asking the FCC to actually hold a hearing on whether it is appropriate to grant Fox and the Murdoch's licensure for their local TV stations, making that big distinction. So please sign on that and spread for those you know who are concerned about the impact of Fox. That's another action you can do. Um, we talked about local news. That was number one. Um, and be a critical supporter. I see some people in the comments with one eye on the screen have done some outreach and some letters to the, ed letters to the editor. But be a critical and supportive consumer. We do something called Heroes and Zeros. They're journalists doing good work. Reach out to them not to support them and say thank you. You'll be surprised the, the number of responses. They'd appreciate it. They're literally under attack. They've got their financial bosses. They've got concerns from people on the right reaching out to them and uh, berating them and calling them the enemy of the people. So to hear a word of good news from someone who writes by, by someone who reads their work is always appreciated. So we call that heroes and zeros. Uh, so say thank you to the heroes and thank a journalist. Um, and then you can join us if you're still on social media, especially Twitter, we're still there. Although of course we'd like not to be with Elon Musk, hard right and uh, white supremacist content, but where the journalists are right now where, is where we are. So we still are on Twitter. Um, we're going to have a pretty special event. You folks are hearing about this before most people in our community. Uh, this is uh, the former prime minister of Australia, Malcolm Turnbull, is going. I'm going to interview him in about a month about the issue of the information warfare, uh, of disinformation, and specifically asking about the Australian experience of the impact of the Murdochs and News Corps in Australia. Um, we may think that this is all novel and happening here. Uh, there's a, a history of uh, right-wing media impacting democracy and impact impeding uh, solutions to the climate crisis in Australia. So uh, we're pretty excited about this. So join us uh, for a Zoom uh, as we talk to the Malcolm Turnbull, uh, prime, former prime minister of Australia about this important issue. Um, and then uh, we're on a, we've got a sub stack. Um, so if you'd like to read, please read our work. Um, and winding down, a few, if there are folks who have the means, we're always appreciative Sorry to do this, but we do not have right money. Why <laughs> right wing oligarchs supporting our work? If there are people of means who could chip in to help us do our work, uh, we are also on socials. We've got a whole slew of things. We're trying to be everywhere. Um, but with that, I'm going to press stop, and I want to hear from folks uh, about their first any questions, and then I'm happy to kind of anything you got. 
thoughts, feedback, anything. You know, if you would maybe look at some of the chat, I think people are asking about some of the um, websites that you have mentioned, how we can connect with you, et cetera. Okay. And I think I heard you say that we're going to have access to the slides. Is that a correct statement? That's correct. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to put them in this and I'm going to put them in the chat right now. Uh, so excellent. So we'll do that. Copy link. And yes. So any with the link, these will be the slides. I might make some edits to them, but these are the slides. Um, Let's see. Yes, yeah, slides. Yep. It's funny. Yeah, it's... I clicked on it and it said it's a suspicious link. Oh, scary. Oh, scary. I know. So I see some of your community does write letters to the editor. That's great. Something else for the skill, just to riff on that. It sounds like so you've already got somebody who's quite skilled. Oh, you know, uh, this is Mary Clemens speaking, and I used to be <clears throat> long, long ago, the president of Women's Voices, and along with uh, Barb Finch and others who she was also a president of Women's Voices, we used to write very good op-ed pieces that would get published in the Post-Dispatch. They no longer even consider them. They have only two uh, columnists who are published frequently on the uh, op-ed page. And our, the editorial staff of the St. Louis po Post-Dispatch doesn't even publish editorials anymore. They take them from Bloomberg News and other sources, and they really don't. Uh, I mean, the paper has dwindled so that it almost is useless. Uh, we still write letters to, and I, I'm noticing that there are very few, they're publishing fewer and fewer letters to the editor from women. And I know we write the letters, but they're mainly men's letters being published. And they go overboard publishing conservative uh, material now. Yeah, I, I don't know. Was that the dispatch you were referring to? Post St. Louis Post Dispatch are the major yeah. newspaper in St. Louis yeah. Pulitzer uh, newspaper. Do we know who owns it now? Because that's one of the things that we've pulled back. Is it part of a larger chain, or yes. is it still independent? Yes, yes, and they don't even do their own uh, copy editing anymore. It's done by, that, by that's out, that's the source. Lee Enterprises, right? So Lee that's one of the terrible. one of the more infamous uh, ones. There's Alden Capital. There's several that have kind of these either hedge funds or these conglomerates that basically buy the paper, sell it off for parts, homogenize as you've seen its content, decrease the number of editors. Therefore, you're going to publish less local. But I will advocate once again, not plugging anything, but that local journalism arrest directory I shared with you will find local papers that are not. We willfully excluded the large chain owned hedge fund managed for the better part papers good, unless absolutely essential good local papers and ellen is on on this call and she publishes frequently and i've had letters to the little local webster kirkwood yeah. times great what what you find is that it's given away and it's a good little paper and it has all the you know we need to know about our local elections and and our school boards and things of that nature and the, the little local papers are good ways to get that information. But what I notice is they lie on the driveways and people don't even pick them up. Mm -hmm. Got it. Anyway, that's my uh, sort of depressing. Well, but, yeah, but I think that, but right, we, we, we're in a point where we're going to have to re-envision how Americans are informed and like the concept of, of, you know that support of local journalism, like the 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 the, sh the shell of the dispatch is is what it is. It's it's not going to get reanimated. But the question is, is what are those other outlets going to be that are going to replace it? You know, there 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 the, the, there's the 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 woman who shared the Nobel Prize in I think 2022, Maria Ressa in the Philippines, uh, you know, established a new organization called the Rappler, 
um, that's a different, you know, the concept of printing a paper in 20 years is going to be obsolete, right? When those of us who grew up doing crossword puzzles is like with a piece of paper and a pen. So you have a pencil, you couldn't do the, that's going to be like, in, you know, the way of the dodo bird. So like new, new organizations are going to need to anticipate where this is all going, which is fully digital. And the Rappler is also going more video. Like why try and insist that people read your copy of 40 paragraphs on what happened yesterday if most people are putting in their earbuds and like going for a jog and that's how they process their news you're kind of you know so the the, the the some of these newer orgs are kind of recognizing and grappling and using an example of the rappler in the philippines maria ressa like brilliant woman kind of that's the, her approach is she's kind of re-envisioned how filipinos are going to get important news uh using the rappler so i just i i know you 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 you, you said you were like on a downer, but it's kind of like Phoenix Flames kind of thing. I mean, there is something rising. It just doesn't seem like it's on the near horizon. Well, somebody just asked who bought the Riverfront Times, which was also a big local uh, news source. I'm not sure who bought it, but uh, Sarah Finsky, who used to work at that paper, uh, now does a newsletter for St. Louis Magazine. And St. Louis Magazine is a a new, sort of a, a newer source of some good local news. Um, Liz. Is that Liz? Oh, you're still muted. Karen, you're muted. Hi there. Thank you. I'm also a former president of Women's Voices, and I'm so glad you're here. I have a couple of comments and then a couple of questions. Um, first of all, I think we have failed to mention the African-American run newspapers. And we have a really good one yes. called the St. Louis American. And I often go to that paper to get a more accurate telling of what's going on in the city, certainly than the Post-Dispatch, uh, which I don't trust particularly. Um, and I don't know how they're being affected by corporate buyouts and by these large conglomerates trying to control the news flow, but um, ours is excellent. So I just wanna put in a plug for that one. And I also agree, I see those newspapers on the you know, driveways all the time too, but I, I read mine online. So I don't think it's necessarily that people aren't reading it, it's that they're not reading the hard copy. Um, and I don't either, I, it's just, I wish they didn't send it to me, it's a waste of paper. So I'm gonna actually tell them now after this conversation, please take me off the delivery list. Um, I also wanted to uh, raise a couple of questions. First of all, you know, I'm, I, this is such a critical issue and I'm disappointed that I love who's here, but I wish we had a much bigger attendance. And that seems to be a problem around this topic. How do we get people engaged, even people who are already engaged, you know, in social justice and in voter rights and in democracy protection to care about this issue? I have a hard time getting my friends even to come to this I'm not exactly sure why. So that's question number one. Question number two is you haven't mentioned anything about foreign influences, but I follow a number of international news outlets and they are all over how Russia is through RT, which is their one of their major news outlets, pumping in misinformation into the, the US news media stream and get, it's getting picked up all over the place and people are believing it. And I think that's another thing we've got to really work on exposing and debunking a lot of that RT. And I'm not going to go into China and all the others, but Russia is a big threat in my mind to our the fairness and um, truth that's uh, being perpetuated in our media or lack thereof, I guess I should say. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think there is, uh, I, I start my slides. I'll, actually, we have our monthly meeting tonight. I'll put the link in the Zoom if you folks want a double dose of this. Tonight we meet at uh, 7 Eastern. Um, but I start with what I call the information war report. It's naive to think that like people are reading the paper and someone's, Elon Musk just bought Twitter because it was a business decision. Like it's naive to think that people aren't manipulating everything we just discussed. I mean, it's going back. And thank you for the fact check. It was Pulitzer who who found found uh, did this to, uh, in St. Louis. Um, I knew there was one of those big 
big wigs uh, your way. Um, so point being is, is, is it's information warfare by any means necessary. It's always been that way. And that's one of the things I've kind of come around to. Like I am very down on the New York Times as the paradigm of journalism in many people's minds, frankly, and comfortable liberals, self-included, have grown up thinking that is the that is a you know progressive or at least a, not even close. It's been a barrier to progress, civil rights, Vietnam War, Gulf War, sabotaging Hillary Clinton, Canada, you know, I mean, it's it's rich. Uh, and it has, in my mind, become the last of them, the, the standing. It's been the beneficiary almost of the collapse of journalism. Because where are you going to go? <laughs> it's almost like you can see them laughing in the boardroom. Yeah, OK, go ahead. You want to read the Washington Post? OK, fine. Where else? You're going to go to Murdoch's? It's in, the, the Wall Street Journal is actively in decline. Its editorial board is Fox News. So for those who don't subscribe to the Wall Street Journal, do not, in my opinion, in that it is not much different than Fox News. I call it highbrow Fox News. Um, but the point being is, is in back to Liz's point, is so for international and where what I, when people are saying, well, if you, you're telling me I can't, I shouldn't be reading the New York Times unless they make some significant changes, you know, I think The Guardian is a fantastic news source. I think the BBC for international news, I you saw Deutsche Welle. I don't know anyone else who's put that up there, but that's great. Like, yeah objective international news, right? Because right now we're Americans are getting a very filtered view of the international, like, I mean, does anyone here besides me who happen to be on Twitter know that the German State Department fact checked Donald Trump and over the weekend? Because of the, the stuff that he made regarding climate and also they even subtexted him at, and we don't eat cats and dogs. Yeah. like. So it's like, but the point being is, is like the world is act, like, it would be great if we had good news sources, right? and especially some of those international ones are actually quite good. So, and the influence, the malign influence. So Murdoch is the internal malign influence or his empire. Uh, but there are absolutely, it's nice to see that the Department of Justice, like, you know, six years too late, woke up to the idea that maybe Russia today is an extension of the soft power of Russia. Um, so this, they, you know, broke the case of tenant media, which is basically Americans who are being cutouts for Russian propaganda. Um, and only because of Russia's imperialist war on Ukraine did we actually stop uh, Russia today from broadcasting in the United States. It probably should have happened sooner than that, but I guess better late than never. Um, so uh, that's a lot. I'm just uh, happy for those questions, Liz, and I see what you see. And, and I'm going to share my screen just for giggles. So that you folks might recognize some of these papers. And we, as part of our work, think it is important to uplift voices of color and news source of color. So we do break down. If you click on Missouri, uh, you'll see some of the papers. They might be familiar. Anybody know the Boonville Daily News? You can tell you how, how in the weeds we get with this sort of stuff. Uh, but we do break it down if it's got some specific feature. So there are four Black-owned, five. The St. Louis American is actually on our list. High five. We're doing our homework. Um, so point being is you've got a couple of these uh, local papers, black owned, or you've got the Kansas City Beacon for those uh, cover state government. We think that's something important, right? Local news, the national outlet. I guarantee you there's no New York Times reporter keeping an eye on politics in Kansas City. So just wanted to share that with you that there's a, we, we do think it's important to not just think of a kind of a you know. Can you send that as a link because a lot of us belong to other organizations and we'd like to be able to send that information out throughout the sure. state? Here, here's, here's the Missouri link specifically. Perfect. Uh, Thank you. Appreciate sure, it. Sure thing. And and if you have some, this is, this, is a, this is a living document. If you've got some feedback. Oh, let me put my email as we come up to the hour. I'm happy oh, to extend please, this. Please, for please another, do. I'm happy to extend and chat with y'all for, for another 15 or so. But uh, I just want to, before I forget, give you my email. Um, so, to add, oh, sorry, Liz, I got to come back to a really important one. You're, you brought up a lot. You're, 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 you're a perfect uh, audience slash uh, we need to engage you in this kind of work. And, and so whatever we can do to inspire you to do this kind of work, this, I would like you to print out, uh, I'm going to share my slide. This needs to be like a slide that you incorporate in every one of your activist sessions, uh, which is the guiding principle that Bob McChesney says, whatever it is. You better change the media. Like you better change the media because without that change, we had somebody. I think it's either Margaret Sullivan or or Gigi Sohn, who was FCC commissioner nominee, who said it should probably be your first. <laughs> like if you set out to improve repro rights, you've got to improve the information diets and the media environment of those people who you think are going to be able to make that change. So 
Somebody said they think it should be at least one A. Maybe it's not one, sorry, it should be one B. Maybe, maybe not one A, but it should be one B. Like two makes it sound too far away. So this is all of those changes, inequality, climate, gun violence, like gun, like, like it's, it, this is the barrier right now. And I, I hope you got my, my overview zooming out of the economic forces that have changed the diets of people. Now people are eating a source that is designed to create what I call a maximally palatable news product because they need eyeballs and clicks and they need to survive. So they need Republicans and Democrats. But right now using Jay Rosen's asymmetry, there's this tremendous asymmetry and the corporate media has kind of averaged out, but you can't average out reality and unreality without compromising reality. Oh, I got to write that down. That was good. We've got it recorded. We've got it recorded. <laughs> <laughs> you can't. I got to write it. Uh, and here's my email. So other questions or thoughts. So Liz, so that's that. That's my that's my comment. Is is that's the work? Is getting people? I would say number one, sign up to read some of those people. Like follow our work. Frankly, just go to our like Frumkin, Rosen, Sullivan. These are three of the biggest, uh, and read Will Bunch, like read these, like sign up and read these people's works and share their work, right? You don't have to be the media critic, but you can amplify and basically inject media criticism into your work. And you can just inject the work of the critics. They're, this, this is their jam, spread their work. So sign up for Margaret Sullivan's Substack, sign up for Jay Rosen's work and follow him. Dan Frumkin's got a Substack. Host Dan Frumkin, he's bigger than us in many ways. He wrote, he watched the world, he wrote, he wrote the Washington Post, and now he's dedicated his life to this concept of media criticism with a goal for improvement. I'll I'll find his uh, his his website for you. Does that partially answer it, Liz? Oh yeah, that was very helpful, and actually, I do want to get involved, so I'll have to figure out. I'll give you where I'll, I'll find I'll, the time to do so. Yeah, it sounds like you got your hands full. So, but let me just I'm going to put. Uh, um the link before anyone drops uh, to get involved with our work i think it's in the slide deck but i'm embarrassed to say i'm not 100 percent sure so i'm saving the chat <laughs> great so our our we meet once a month via zoom it just so happens that tonight is the next one at 7 p eastern you can sign up there it's via zoom that's why i was asking your your, your model of organizing our leadership team is in california new york arizona you know, it's kind of it's all over the place. So, and we'll have about 30 to 50 people on the Zoom tonight talking about this. Unfortunately, Liz and I already have another meeting tonight, but hopefully somebody else can be on the call. <laughs> make, make sure to come to our, you know, start following our Substack, get on our newsletter. Um, oh, I should put that in there. You can, if, if you if you put your emails in the chat, I'll, I'll add, or maybe they, we have it somewhere where I can just ask you to sign in to the newsletter. I'm getting too old for yeah. logging into that thing and um is it here so any other questions while i'm looking for links well i'll see um because i know who signed up for this webinar and i'll see how we can get the emails to you i'm not a techie person and i admit it but i'm sure somebody on this call can help me with that <laughs> Here's one. Here's how to get on our newsletter. I found it. So tiny.cc, our capital, newsletter capital in. Got to be capitals. And that'll get you on our newsletter. And then, um, and you'll get these slides. Links also there. Um, but yeah, I think the big take home is uh, media reform and support for good journalism are essential to all the work you all doing. And hopefully I've given you some suggestions. And, and don't be disappointed if those letters to the editor go down meekly. Well, I don't see anyone else's hand up at the moment. I may have missed it, but a shout out, Ellen, thank you for setting this up. Milo, thank you. I'm just blown away. My biggest concern is how these contracts are, you know, are given for like Murdoch, you know, how that continues to happen. And there's some places in Missouri that that is the only news outlet they have which is a great concern. So um, if anyone else has a question. That's the educator pregnant pause. You wait seven seconds. <laughs> um, thank you 
for being on the call with all of us. I appreciate the comments. And now we kind of have our marching orders to share this information with our friends. And maybe within our little group, we can come up with um, a subgroup to work on letters to the editor and, and, and. So go ahead, Milo. I saw your finger up to talk to us. Oh, you're, you're, you are an educator. You saw the student in the front row who is chomping at the bit. Uh, this is one thought I will share with you that this may be helpful to you. You, you folks have been doing incredible work for that you have the, the, the staying power of, of, of 20 years of this kind of work. There was a similar, if I may, community uh, and a leader uh, in another state uh, who came for about a year, changed regularly to our meetings. And then she actually initiated in her community almost the equivalent, if I may, of a media watchdog group, uh, a multidisciplinary group of pastors, social justice advocates, um, people in climate crisis, animal rights, and this community themselves formed a local media watchdog group uh, that would, with some of the main paper in their community, kind of monitor how their issues and the power from that came from that it wasn't just a bunch of media critics, so to speak. It was actually these other orgs lent their credibility that the that the that several uh, several religious institutions got involved. They were covering racial justice coverage specifically was one of those issues is how is crime covered? Are there racist undertones or overtones in crime criminal coverage of crime in the paper? Um, and and so maybe thinking of, of 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 using this as an opportunity to to partner with some of your sister orgs uh, about the issue. Another is specifically. I know this is a, a, a women run organization. Uh, there there is an org. I can't find their more recent work. That was uh, I think it was called the Gender Avenger. If I may be so blunt, uh, I think that's the title. Um, and what they did is they actually looked, I think someone here said something about letters to the editor, mostly published by men. And I, I, I hear that. And there is still profound asymmetry and sexism and also at bylines. And so what Gender Avenger did 20 years, not 20 years, like two or three years ago is they actually looked at the New York Times over like a three month period. And they literally just did like little hand counting. They were like, how many clearly gender specific male, female bylines are there on the front page of the New York Times. And I'm, I'm just throwing some projects if you want to lean specifically into sexism in media, there are small projects that might be of interest that one could actually do with, you know, a calculator and, and a spreadsheet, um, thinking of media and just making your making it your own, the issues that you cover. Uh, you know, we made two guidelines, one for repro rights and one for climate coverage. Perhaps you all come together with what you think is the main, the, maybe a first issue that you think as a community is the most important that is not being adequately covered in your community or want improved coverage of that issue and in drafting your own. Uh, you know, it, it very well could be Women's Voices Raised Guide to Media Coverage of Repro Rights. Like, you, yeah. I'm sure you all could do even better. And workshop ours, ours is the beta version. It's just to be, it's to be used, but also to be used by thoughtful people like yourselves to make it better. Like, it's not perfect. It needs to be updated. Well, I'm excited to see people on this call that I have not had the privilege to meet. So hopefully I get to meet you at some of our program meetings, but now I've got names with faces and we will be reaching out. I, I'm gonna, I always refer, um, refer to myself as a resistor sister, you know, so um, maybe we can come up with some of these and implement some of the ideas that Milo just shared with us. And Amy, I saw that you just joined us. Sorry, you weren't on the whole time, but we have recorded the program and um, Milo has graciously shared the slides. So um, thank you. No problem. No problem. We It takes a village. It really does take a village to make all of this work. And I'm just thrilled that we had so many people join us. And again, Ellen, thank you for doing this.